So I don't know about all of you, but a year ago, I wouldn't have even thought we'd be having a conversation. Payments was still in the future. But I'm excited that as we have this conversation this year, it's actually here and now, and we can start to talk about it. Um, so I'm, please help me welcome Marcus Brown, who's the CEO of Wirecard, which is a company that, how many of you have heard of Wirecard, first of all? Okay, so a lot of folks, you know, in the States, maybe not so much because they operate a lot behind the scenes. Um, but I'm really looking forward to a discussion on where mobile payments are today and where we're going. So, welcome. So, I mean, maybe that's the place to start, Marcus. Where are we today as far as mobile payments? I mean, how far have we gotten? What's holding us up? Let me first uh, thank you, thank DLD to inviting me again. I think DLD is a great entrepreneurial platform. Uh, and I think, to say it a little bit political, we need in Europe more entrepreneurship and less government spending. So I think DLD is a very good catalyst for uh, a, a positive entrepreneurial spirit, and I ver I, we very much like that. Coming to mobile, I think last year we had a big discussion whether NFC will be the technology of choice for mobile. I think we can definitely say that 2014 brought here a lot of, let's say, improvement. I think today NFC is definitely set as the first standard technology for mobile. We know that the last big uh, smartphone producer, Apple, is now also going for NFC. Uh, and we know that the big card organizations, Visa and MasterCard, have been fooling throwing their power behind NFC. Uh, it will become mandatory for new swipe machines, terminals to speak NFC. So we definitely think that in the next three to five years, mobile payment will come at the point of sale. So we're going to get to Apple in a second, but I want to take a step back and just ask, why is it, what is it about mobile payments that's going to make it take off? I mean, credit cards aren't that hard to use. Is it just the convenience? Is it going to be faster? What is going to be the real selling point for getting consumers to care enough? Because if consumers don't care, merchants don't want to do it just, just because. It's an added cost. It saves them some money down the road. What's going to make, what's going to be the inflection point? What's going to push it over the edge? Or has it already happened? Yeah. Let me first start a little bit from the bigger picture. I think we are seeing the trend that internet technology is entering in a lot of areas the physical world. Smartphone is a first example. Before smartphones came up, we had legacy cell phones. Today, smartphones are basically small PCs running on internet technology. We will see it with cars, and we are definitely convinced that also the whole point of sale infrastructure of a retail merchant will totally converge in the next three to five years towards internet technology. So mobile payment is just the first example for this trend. Uh, I think for the consumer, it will bring uh, a much quicker checkout process. It will bring a lot of additional value-added services uh, around loyalty couponing, and it will bring for the merchant the ability to much better understand the consumer and in real time, like online, tune his offering to the actual need of the consumer in a point of sale situation. Is there a part of the world that's leading this? Is there a place where I would go today where I'd be most likely to be able to pay by my phone? Is it the US with Apple Pay? Is it somewhere else in the world? Where is this really taking off or where is it most prevalent? I think if we discuss NFC, smartphone uh, driven mobile payment, it will definitely be Europe and the US who first will adapt to that. The US always is quite advanced. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, some countries where already you find a high density of NFC terminals. The UK, Spain, Poland, to name some of them. Also France uh, is very much taking up speed. So I would say in the next three to five years, we will, we will find a 100% density uh, of terminal infrastructure in, in, Europe, in, in Europe and Asia. Uh, in Europe and US. In Asia, we will find this technology very early in some big cities. We have, for example, first examples in Singapore, 
uh, we have first examples in Jakarta, where we are enabling uh, the payment process over the Jakarta bus, bus transport system with NFC technology. Uh, so I would say in the big mega cities, it will also be something who comes quite quickly in the emerging countries in more rural areas. We will st still see for some time more legacy cell phones used. Therefore, the technology behind will not so much be NFC. It will be more SMS and USSD based technology. And of course, you always have to adapt to uh, this, the, the cell phone landscape you find in the specific country. Definitely. But we think that in all of these areas, mobile payment also will be a catalyst, especially also in emerging countries, to bring, to bring people into the whole financial landscape. And we're going to talk make about them that banked. tomorrow. Uh, I'm talking with the head of uh, one of the top officers at India's largest carrier. And we'll, we'll talk about the emerging markets, because it really is, as you say, it's really different if I'm taking the credit card I already have and using it via mobile phone than if I'm it's some new mechanism if it's over SMS. But talk about the developed world future for a second. Three to five years from now, how different is the shopping experience? Is it only transformed in that instead of handing a credit card, I wave my phone? Or will the buying experience change far more? Yes, we definitely think that the buying experience will totally change. So it will be possible that in an indoor situation in a shop, you get in real time additional information about the product you're standing before. The merchant will be able to tune his discount offering, for example, to your real time interest. So not only to the product you're currently looking at, but also to your buying history and your historic interest. So I think a lot of features that made internet big, this real-time ability to tune your offering so similar, for the consumer will be possible. Similar to today we so. see with Amazon, they know what I've been browsing, they know that I go look at the new camera lenses every couple weeks, and they send me emails, they go, hey, you know, are you still looking for that camera lens? That same experience is coming to the physical exactly. market. Exactly. They know what simple. aisle I'm walking down. How about the privacy issues around that? You think consumers are okay with having messages targeted them while they walk in the stores? Uh, for example, if we come to the real payment process, we are today able to provide mobile or over a mobile payment app the same security level you find with your physical card. So it's basically an EMB transaction. Wait, it's same, a normal cost this, present the, transaction. So you basically, it will be possible to supply the same security level you find today at the chip and pin transaction. Now, maybe in Europe that's a comforting statement. Coming from the United States, promising me the same security I have today, every card in my wallet has been breached a couple of times. Is there an opportunity for the security be, to be better or you know, is it still going to be three numbers on the back of the card? Are there going to be three numbers printed on the back of my phone? Uh, without going into in, in too much detail, uh, in the US, you still find a lot of magnetic stripe implementations. So generally spoken, in the US, uh, pin protection is not so widespread. Mm -hmm. So I think here we are much more advanced in Europe. So generally spoken, the security standard at the point of sale in the US is a little bit lagging behind. In Europe, we're already completely focusing on chip and pin. And this is, of course, the message. Mobile payment will be able to keep the same standard you today find at the point of sale. But of course, in the US, you first need this transformation towards chip and pin. Well, I want to open it up in a second for questions, so be thinking if you have questions. But let's talk about Apple for a second. What does it mean? What did Apple's entry into the market with Apple Pay? What did that mean for mobile payments as a whole? I think it's a, it's a, it's a big, big additional boost. They have been the last of the big hardware producers or smartphone producers that were not behind uh, NFC. I think uh, for the whole mobile payment story, it is a big additional value add. So we're, we're very happy that Apple is going down this route. Uh, and also, let's say, going for open technologies like tokenization technology, like NFC, and is, let's say, integrating themselves very complementary in today's 
ecosystem of credit cards. Because that was the big worry, that Apple was going to basically try and take over the whole value chain. And I think most of the industry breathed a sigh of relief when they came out with Apple Pay and said, oh, they're really, they're really just bringing us new customers. Was that your reaction? Yeah, I think they, they very much stay at their core competence. This is selling smartphones and providing access to their consumer base. Uh, and in the back end, they are totally relying on best practice technologies, such as tokenization technology, such as NFC. The only difference is they integrate the NFC not on the SIM card, but they have it directly in the hardware. Uh, and of course, they are totally relying on today's payment options and payment solutions uh, that you today find in the electronic ecosystem. So I also I want to talk about what's working in mobile payments. And the two best examples that I can think of, again, these are United States examples, don't involve companies like yours and the traditional industry. It's, it's brands that have done it on their own. So to me, the two that stand out are people paying essentially with a barcode at Starbucks using their prepaid loyalty card, and then Apple letting you go into their store and check yourself out. If I want to buy, you know, I'm always buying a new cord for my iPhone because I always lose them. I go in there, I just scan it, and I've paid, and I don't talk to a checkout. Why isn't the mainstream mobile payment getting there, and when will they? Again, mainstream mobile payment today is totally leveraging today's infrastructure at the merchant. So basically, it's the same Visa and MasterCard access point that is already there. Uh, we are able to provide some innovative virtual Visa and MasterCards on prepaid basis in a mobile wallet, but basically it's a normal Visa and MasterCard that is rolled into but this wallet. But isn't that wallet. setting the bar too low? I mean, if, if mobile payments just replicate my credit card, yes, it's a little more convenient, yes, it's a little safer. Doesn't the industry have to do something radically better to get people excited and interested? Why is it that Starbucks can get you know, a huge percentage of its customers paying by mobile and the rest of the industry is still way behind? I think Starbucks is a good example of a high-frequency merchant uh, where the same customer goes there every day. Uh, and uh, this is exactly the first killer app, so to say, for mobile payment, such as, for example, local transport. We also have in London a project with Vodafone, uh, Vodafone Smart Pass uh, that we support from the technology and the issuing process is now compatible with the Oyster card that is run uh, in, the, in the London underground system. And this is also a good example where over uh, uh, making, let's say, the check-in much quicker, uh, this will be the first apps that really work. And then additionally, of course, we will find a, a big bunch of added value services that are just very early stage that will bring this digital lifestyle and this internet lifestyle to the smartphone and to the point of sale. Okay, are there questions in the audience on mobile payments? We have one in the back. Um, are there microphones? He's coming to you with a mic, so. Lizbeth McNabb, I'm interested in your perspective on not only frequency, but Starbucks having the rewards program and you know, certain sectors have them and certain ones don't. Any trends you're seeing on there? How important is so, loyalty? So I think the question had to do with Starbucks. It's not just about payment. It's tied in with their loyalty system. A lot of the mobile payments actually have stood in between a, a merchant and a customer and make that loyalty process more difficult. How important is loyalty? It's very important. So of course, payment in itself is always a hygienic process. So nobody likes to pay. The payment process itself just has to work very quickly at a high quality level and you have to solve bottleneck situations. And I think that's the big, let's say, added value of payment as a straight process. It will solve bottleneck situations. It will be possible in the future that, for example, you go into a store and you don't have to go to a certain point in the store, but you can pay directly when you take out a product over your smartphone. That's the vision that we call e-point of sale. And additionally, of course, the big added value will come from this added value services, such as loyalty and couponing, and Starbucks is the first example. Uh, we, will con we can consider a lot of additional value added services. Money remittance is, of course, uh, already an, a second service 
that can be provided so you very easily can interchange digital money between two wallets. But these are just first the first examples and we're really here at the version 1.0. So we're really in the beginning, and the whole DLD is, of course, labeled. It's just beginning, and this is, of course, very true for online and for mobile. So we're at the same stage where internet has been about 2001. Oh, cool. Okay, other questions? Don't be shy. All right, well, one thing that, um, since we have an extra minute or two, um, you guys have a very interesting story. You've been leading since 2001. Where was Wirecard when you started? There wasn't a mobile phone to make, a smartphone to make payments. How, where was the company when you took over? Of course, it, it came from online. So internet, uh, Wirecard is a classical internet startup. I think the fascinating element generally about technology companies is you're permanently, strategically adapting to new developments. Internet is now really taking off speed. So even with internet, we are just at the beginning. If you take payment processes, perhaps five to six percent of all uh, online real-time payment processes are today online. The majority is still point of sale. It's 90 to 95 percent. And today, we really have the chance to bring internet technologies to the other sales channels, to mobile, and of course, also to the point of sale. So, so pay, you know, get get the crowd a little excited as as we're getting ready for lunch. A year from now, what will we be able to do uh, with mobile payments that we can't do today? Yeah, let me say the vision is that you go in the future into a store, you are directly checked into the merchant app, and when you take out a product from a shelf, you get directly additional offerings. Might it be couponing offerings, or, the, or might it be special interest offerings? And then you can directly pay over your smartphone because the smartphone links the cash desk app of the merchant with your mobile wallet and you just leave the store without going to any uh, physical cash desk. And I think this will be of course a revolution. We still find in a lot of retail stores this queuing before cash desks. And this is of course one thing that definitely can be solved. Okay, well I'm definitely, if, if the mainstream, industry hasn't, at least in some instances, caught up with Apple and Starbucks. I'm going to say that they win and you guys don't. But thank you very much for your time. Uh, Marcus Braun, the CEO of Wirecard. Thanks, everyone.